Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Um, good morning. Can I begin by welcoming our witnesses <clears throat> excuse me, this morning. David Goodhart, who is Head of Demography, Immigration and Integration at Policy Exchange. Sunda Katwala, the Director of British Future. And Jonathan Portis, Professor of Economics and Public Policy at King's College London. We are very grateful as a committee to all of you for coming along here today to assist us with our inquiries. Can I kick off uh, with a question? The government... Ministers have said to various parts of business, well, we don't want you to suffer skill shortages as a result of us leaving the European Union. Uh, at the same time, the, the government's policy is to get the net migration target down to the tens of thousands. And I suppose the question I wanted to ask, given the dependence that certain sectors of the economy have on EU workers at the moment. I'd be interested in the view as to how you think those two objectives can be reconciled. I don't know who wants to kick off. Uh, 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 please. Um, uh, skill shortage is, is quite a difficult and loaded term in labour market economics because, I mean, there are people who not unreasonably say, well, there's no such thing as a skill shortage as such. There's simply a price. If you, uh, um, if you reduce the availability of uh, workers with a particular set of skills or characteristics, um, if you reduce the supply, um, then uh, the price will go up. That is to say, wages will go up, demand will therefore fall. Um, so you will have uh, higher wages. You will have fewer people employed in that sector. You will have um, less output in the economy as a whole, less taxes, and so on. Um, and that is, uh, I think, you know, the evidence of, uh, uh, that we have from the um, labor market economic uh, empirical analysis of, uh, uh, of the labor market impacts of migration in the UK is that most of, the, uh, um, most of the, the reaction to increases in supply or reductions in supply of migrant workers is simply on the amount of labor that is actually supply to the economy. So if, um, the, uh, uh, if we reduce availability of migrant workers, then uh, the output, the number of people employed in the relevant sectors will shrink, the amount produced will shrink, the economy will shrink. Um, it is, not sorry? Just not grow. No, I mean, it will shrink if relative. Sorry? If you stop the inflow, the economy will not grow as much, it won't shrink. No, Peter, as you know, the turnover in the uh, labour market is much higher than stocks at any one point. Uh, the net change is much smaller than the gross change. So since gross, what you will be acting on is gross flows into a particular sector, you would expect the sector to shrink in absolute terms. Um, now, obviously, it will also shrink relative to what otherwise would have happened. Um, but it is not, the, uh, uh, um, it's not uh, necessarily the case that uh, the sector won't shrink. That would depend on the specifics of a particular sector, obviously. Um, but but, next. Sorry? Will the economy will automatically shrink if there's no net inflow of labour? Well, I, we weren't, I wasn't talking about the economy as, as a whole. I was talking about how, uh, 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 um, how particular sectors would respond. Some would grow slower than they otherwise would have. Exactly. Some would shrink in absolute terms. The economy as a whole, no, um, restricting the inflow of, of migrant labour, depending on what the, just how strict the restrictions were and what the reduction was, that would be a reduction in GDP and number of people employed relative to what otherwise would have happened. So it might be the case that the economy shrunk, it might not. That would depend, of course, on all the other things that are going on in the economy. As, 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 oh, you're quite right. But I do think it's, it is quite important, actually, while we're on this, to make this distinction between net and gross in labor market terms. Um, the number of uh, um, uh, uh, the, the net, net growth in employment in the UK is typically perhaps a few tens of thousands a month or a few hundreds of thousands a year. The number of people 
changing, moving into employment or moving out of employment every year is, depending on how you count it, more like four to six million. Um, so there is this huge turnover of, uh, uh, of workers in, in, most, in all sectors of the economy, much bigger than any of the net changes. And of course, if you're looking at changes to immigration policy or to, to who, and specifically, who employers can hire, um, it's quite important to look at those, uh, uh, the dynamics of that at, at the same time. Um, but back, back to your point, I mean, I think, uh, um, you know, the, 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 the short answer is employers would adjust. The question is, how would they adjust? Would they adjust by reducing employment and output? Would they adjust by increasing wages? Would they adjust by um, productivity, enhancing productivity, perhaps by uh, uh, um, you know, investing more in capital and producing labor-saving machinery? Um, all of those, would they adjust by raising prices? All of those adjustments are possible margins. We think we know from the empirical evidence in the UK that most of the adjustment appears to happen on the output and employment side. But of course, the past does not necessarily tell you what will happen in the future, and you might see differences of margins of adjustment in the future. <coughs> Can I just following out that point, if one takes the sector of the economy where, according to statistics we've got, you have the highest proportion of employees who were born in the EEA, which is accommodation and food services, now, um, presumably in that sector, there would be limits to the extent to which employers could do the things that you've just described in order to mitigate a reduction of uh, labour coming in to assist them. Um, would you say that it was easier in, in some sectors than others uh, to try and accommodate? I th it's very difficult, ex ante, to imagine, to, to, to anticipate exactly how, yeah. particularly in a, a sector like the accommodation and food sector, which covers big businesses, small business, and a whole range of different activities. I think at a previous committee, I gave the example of, of uh, um, uh, 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 looking at mechanization, the example that, 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 that you could, you can, in principle, replace baristas with high-tech machines. There has been quite a, a lot of advance in, in the sort of tech, the technology of making good coffee in recent years. And um, if labor became sufficiently difficult to obtain or sufficiently expensive, I would expect to see some substitution away from employment to okay. expensive machines. Equally, I would expect um, in that sector quite a bit of the adjustment to take place through prices. So you might just see higher prices. OK, thank you. Now, Sorry, can I yeah. Are you saying then um, our productivity issue in the United Kingdom may well be addressed if there was a, a, a change in the flow of labour into the economy because employers who currently don't look at ways of increasing productivity may be forced to do so? Um, it's certainly possible that one, pro one response to, uh, to a reduction in labour supply is to increase capital intensity or to make better use of technology so as to, to increase productivity. Of course it can go the other way and one of the interesting findings of the recent literature is that actually even low skilled, apparently low skilled migration um, can enhance the productivity of an economy overall because of complementarity. So for example if you have a greater supply of domestic service workers it turns out that um, high-skilled professional women in the native labour force are actually more likely to go out to work, which enhances the productivity of the economy overall. So it's quite difficult to trace these effects through. Um, I, and there is this interesting contrast between the sort of micro-productivity enhancing impacts of reduced labour supply, which are possible, and the evidence from the IMF which suggests that looked on a cross-country basis, low-skilled migration actually appears to enhance the productivity of an economy on a, you know, looked at the macro level. Okay, now Mr. Cutwell and then well, Mr. There is, a, there is clearly, I think, a, a conflict or a trade-off. And, uh, you know, the very nature of Brexit is it's a reset moment on immigration, on our EU immigration in particular, and it changes the question. The question before we had the referendum is, do you want to adopt these club rules because there's a club you can be part of and if so you're going to constrain your immigration policy and the answer to that has been no and so now we face I think we should make a distinction between two questions when looking at the you know the contrast between what business would want or say its needs and what there's public and political consent for we've now got to come up with a new framework 
within which we make the policy choices about EU immigration or non-EU immigration, and then we've got to make some policy decisions within it. So in a way, I think you know, it, it's, it, it might be a mistake to say, well, obviously we will constrain our discussion about the framework to the immigration target that was set by a, a government in 2010 and 2015, because you've already made a lot of decisions. If, if that's what you're doing, then whatever framework you have, your policy is going to be to cut everything. EU immigration, non-EU immigration that you already had control of but that was higher than the target. Um, there, is, there are very different levels of public permission for different kinds of the EU and EEA immigration we've got. People are broadly warm to the skilled immigration we've got. They, there is not public consent or political consent for the current level and pace of unskilled immigration. If we dig into that, there are very different public views about different types of low-skilled and semi-skilled immigration. People are broadly warm and receptive to um, the needs of care homes for migrant labour. About a quarter of people would, would, would cut that. They are less sympathetic to the hospitality sector. So we might be picking up some views about the reputations of different um, employers in terms of what they say about needs or what they're doing about training um, and so on. So there's another balance to be struck here, which is that a more complex system could be more responsive if it was sector-based or uh, introduced to, to, public, to public differentiations of that kind, but it would be more complex. Mm -hmm. and, a, and a simpler system um, would be different. But I think, I think there's probably quite a strong view that people have very different views about the skilled and low-skilled immigration and that you could have a system that tried to adopt that rather than just saying cut everything. OK, thank you. Mr Goodhart. Uh, yeah, as you implied, Chairman, uh, I think there is a pretty broad consensus that for highly skilled employees there should be there should continue to be an assumption that it should be pretty easy for people from the European Union to come here some sort of fast track light touch system um, but um, for European Union employment more generally and don't forget what two, more than two-thirds of it tended to be in middle and lower skill areas the question is with those numbers coming down um, what capacity have we got in this country to take up the slack? Um, and I think one of the things we should look at, uh, and that isn't focused on enough, is the fall-off in training of UK-born employees, or the fall-off in training in general over the last uh, 15 or 20 years. Um, there's a, a, a paper called What Has Happened to the Training of Workers in Britain by Francis Green at UCL, which estimates that between 1997 and 2012, the training time per worker declined by about a half. I mean, a really radical fall off in training levels um, on some estimates. And I think, uh, you know, certain sectors of British industry have had a kind of free lunch. I mean, they have, you know, they, they have relied on the training systems of other countries. Um, so I think that does suggest, I mean, the construction sector, for example, we had uh, construction sector is already lobbying to say everybody in the construction sector should be regarded as highly skilled. Uh, we had the boss of Crest House Builders, I think, saying this in the papers the other day. Um, do you know the number of construction apprenticeships that started last year in Britain was 8,000? That's not a very impressive record. So I think there is capacity to take up some of this slack. OK, uh, Seema just wanted to come in. Seema Malhotra on this. Clarification, thank you very much for, uh, for that contribution. I want to just clarify, in the analysis, um, the research undertaken, does it suggest that the fall off for the drop off in training is from workplace based training that has been led by employers, or has that been as a result of shifts in government policy? Is there any conclusions about how that might be addressed in, in, in that report? Um, on the, um, the paper I'm talking about is about um, employer uh, investment and training, not, not changes in, um, I mean, I, I mean our, our training system has become much more heavily dependent on the state um, uh, in, in the last 20 years, I mean, partly through um, a huge expansion of higher education. I mean, a lot of employers have, just, have taken on graduates who, because they, they are more flexible and they're, they're likely to turn up on time and so on. So um, there's been a shift from private to public in the training of UK-born people. 
Okay, thank you. Jeremy Lefroy. Thank you. Good morning. Um, the Prime Minister, in her speech on the 17th of January, said uh, fairness demands that we deal with another issue as soon as possible, too. Uh, we want to guarantee the rights of EU citizens who are already living in Britain and the rights of British nationals in other member states as early as we can. And then she went on to talk about the discussions that she'd had with EU leaders. But would your view be that the UK should make a unilateral decision uh, in this respect rather than waiting for a decision from uh, the European Union. When we um, spoke with EU citizens based in the UK and UK citizens based in uh, the EU, we were struck by the unanimity there that the UK should make this offer. It would be seen as um, very important for uh, giving stability to people living in the UK and indeed would probably mean that there would be some reciprocity coming uh, in, in future from, from the EU. W what are your views on that? Um, I, I'll take that one first. I mean, um, I, I would be in favour uh, myself of, of the British government acting first and securing the reciprocity. Um, British Future um, were advocating on this issue um, ahead of the referendum and trying to demonstrate what a broad base of support there was. And we were working with you know, groups from the Joint Council of Welfare of Immigrants to Migration Watch to say this, everybody in this debate can agree that future rule changes shouldn't affect people um, currently here. And, and after the referendum, very strong public support on both sides of the referendum, we ran a process that was very much cross-referendum with the Institute of Directors there, um, the TUC there, MPs from different sides of the referendum, one of the UKIP uh, leadership candidates. And that, that group um, all agreed, actually, that they thought uh, a unilateral guarantee could work and wouldn't put, wouldn't put British nationals at risk and was the right thing to do um, anyway. What we don't know, and the government hasn't said so much about this, is what, what is the bar to, to you know, all governments saying we want to do the right thing and doing it as soon as possible? Because if the bar is simply um, uh, no um, negotiation without notification, then you would like to think we could settle the principle on day one and get the detail going. If, if, if the view was to be taken, um, you know, nothing is agreed until everything is agreed, and this might be hanging over people for two years, I think that would be an absolutely ghastly situation to be in, and I think you need to open it up. So whether it's unilateral or it's um, reciprocal, you know, just the soonest possible point would be good. I think there's a general sort of assumption that, you know, people sort of should know this will be okay because everyone's committed. When we've gone and held meetings and hearings with, say, EU nationals in Coventry, uh, people, you know, quite organised people come to such a meeting quite high up and in the middle of the labour market in different ways, genuinely uncertain as to what the decision will be and saying, well, if we're asked to leave, of course, we would have to. And so I think we shouldn't underrate that sense. And, you know, there are lots of major stories quite, you know, fairly so if, if the Home Office is getting things wrong in the way it's treating people, and it certainly is. Um, that, that is adding to this anxiety that maybe, maybe quite a lot of people will be cut out. Maybe some people will be in and some people won't. So, the, you know, the Prime Minister is making increasingly clear what she wants the outcome to be, but people are still rather worried about whether it will apply to them. Thank you. Um, good to I, mean, I, I suppose there is a question of, uh, you know, whether it, if people know this is happening anyway, what is the capacity for creating goodwill? Um, I mean, it's not going to create very much goodwill if everybody is, is, is in Europe is expecting it. Um, having said that, I do think, um, particularly as Sunda says, it's almost too late now. I mean, assuming Article 50 is triggered at the end of March, um, it's almost too late now to make the gesture, assuming that it's going to be the first thing that will be dealt with. If we have um, as you suggest, uh, a kind of one of these, you know, we can't agree on anything until we agree on everything, uh, so we're going to have another two years of limbo, then I think there, there is a case perhaps for, uh, for Britain making a unilateral gesture. Um, I just confine myself, uh, you know, I, I don't disagree with what Tunda and David have said, uh, uh, um, confine myself saying that the administrative complexities of any system um, cannot be underestimated. We're talking about potentially up to three million people. We do not have a population register in this country. We do not have a comprehensive database about who is here and who isn't in any one time. Um, Sunder sort of implied that everybody would be in. And the fact is that some people will not be in. A significant number of people will not qualify under almost any conceivable system. Um, and uh, uh, that dealing with that one way or another, having a process, having uh, a legal process, you know, having law um, 
guidance, administrative procedures, computer systems, people to deal with for this number of people is a big task. And so I think regardless of the politics of the negotiations, the sooner the government starts putting in place um, the systems and processes needed to deal with this, the better for everybody, for all of us. In terms of who should qualify, of course that's right about the administrative complexity. I think the principle is anybody who is here um, qualified to exercise free movement rights or under our membership of the European Union must have the right to stay um, and to settle and to not be treated less favourably than they currently are. Now, Organising that is enormously complex, and that is a reason to get on with it. There were take take permanent residents where you've been here um, five years. Um, there were uh, 27,000 applications in 2015. There were 21,000 in a quarter in 2016, the third quarter mm -hmm. after the referendum. So there's an immediate tripling of the pace of applications, and you know quite a lot of examples of things going uh, wrong already. And this is the very organised group of people. That 21,000 in that quarter, that's 1% of the 2 million people who have got five years um, residence, about two thirds of the group. And there's another million people um, who, who, are, who are here qualified under free movement without five years yet. So this is the biggest task the Home Office has ever undertaken. And I think getting into the detail of how that can work and what are the simpler ways to um, administrate the easy cases of people in employment with a lot of footprint on our HMRC records and so on. The current systems will not do this properly without having a massive knock-on effect for um, everything else the Home Office is doing and sending, I think, a very bad reputational signal if we drop the ball. You know, nobody wants, and you know, different bits of our immigration system have not worked well in the past. Nobody wants everyone in Europe living here wanting to carry on to have their passport in a, in a warehouse somewhere of an, uh, an open post for six months. Uh, and you need to put operations in place if that's not going to happen. I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think we need to frighten ourselves too much here. I mean, uh, this can happen over quite a long period of time, 18 months, two years. I mean, the, the nearly 2 million people who would qualify automatically for permanent residence. Uh, much of this can be done online. <clears throat> you know, if you've been living in the country for five or six or 10 years, I mean, it's relatively easy to prove it. Um, we can, open, you know, post offices can, can, can have somebody who's, who's trained to, to, um, to, to respond to these applications. Um, I mean, it, yeah, we will need to employ a few hundred or a few thousand more people, but, you know, this is, um, you know, this is not like fighting the Second World War. I mean, you can't, you can't uh, do it. The, <clears throat> the only observation I would make, I mean, the evidence we had uh, previously on this suggested that the current refusal or declared invalid rate for applications for permanent residence was running at about 30%. I don't know what the figures are for the, the upsurge that we have seen. And I'm, I mean, I know from personal constituency experience, <coughs> someone who's lived in the country 40 years, an EU <coughs> national, who's just applied and has just been turned down because the paperwork wasn't adequate. And therefore, it really comes to the point that's been made about, it's an 85-page form currently, um, and the idea that three million people are going to fill in an 85-page form, it could be argued, um, and that's all going to be quite straightforward. It does appear to suggest that some easier way of dealing with this yeah. will be required. The refusal rate in the upsurge was 32%. 32, 32 um, right. Um, uh, for other forms of ILR, it's 5%. Um, we tried to look in the evidence we were receiving from employers and others what was going on. Um, the single biggest thing that would make most difference there is the um, requirement for comprehensive health mm -hmm. insurance. Um, <coughs> this was a change in 2004. If you were from um, the A8 or the A2, you might well have heard about it in terms of the information you were given and when it happened and how you registered. If you were from the old <coughs> EU15, you very likely never heard about it. If you were living here as the stay-at-home mum of a British national for the last 20 years, people changed the rules as to what your status was. There was no information sent to you. So either waiving that so as to say um, we will not refuse on that grounds alone, 
or um, another way to say something rather similar, treating eligibility to use the NHS as fulfilling that um, would would deal with a lot of the of of, of the refusals. Um, and you know, you're going to have to work out what to do with all of this groups. So that would probably be the biggest yeah. single change um, there. The other thing about the complexity is, you know, you're not allowed to have been outside of the country for 450 days across the five years or 90 days in a year. And we check that by asking you to record every single time you took a Eurostar with flight for a weekend anywhere across a five-year period. So there are bits of information we could be savvier about. We also, um, employers will face a, a, a massive burden, not of their current employees, but of all of their previous employees, unless we pass a simple regulatory change and say that local authority nationality checkers and the Home Office can use the HMRC database for this purpose. There will be lots of difficult cases, as Jonathan says, people who are self-employed, people who are in vulnerable forms of employment, but there are, uh, you know, well over a million, couple of million cases that should be straightforward <coughs> and that you could make changes that would make it more handleable. Okay. Joe, please. Just, just one. Yes. Yeah. Dr. Portes, could you, you would talk about people who might not qualify, even though they're European Union citizens uh, living and perhaps working in this country at the moment, why wouldn't they qualify? Well, it depends what, uh, um, as Sundar has, has effectively said, it depends what rules we put in place. So um, we could, at the, mi the minimum that we could do legally is to say that people who've been here five years um, in, and have satisfied the other conditions, like, as Sundar says, having comprehensive health insurance. Uh, in some form qualify. That would exclude quite a lot of people. Um, at the other end, we could say that everybody who was here um, on uh, June 23rd or some other date um, qualified, in which case we would have to come up with a system which allows them to prove their eligibility. My point is that whatever, there will have to be some set of criteria, um, whether it is as, uh, I, you know, uh, an extended stay, doing something productive like working or being in other, some other way exercising your free movement rights at one end of the spectrum, or at the, uh, a much more liberal end, just saying, well, you were here on that date and you were here not just as a tourist or something. Um, whatever that set of criteria, you, we will have to have a process which allows people to demonstrate, and that can be light touch through to the 87-page form we have at the moment. Um, but. Whenever you have a system like that, a bureaucratic system um, that deals with three million people, there will be people on one side of the line and people on one, the other side of the line. That is simply inevitable. Um, I worked for a long time in the Department of Work and Pensions, which deals with millions of people. There are people every day. We deny people the right to job seekers allowance or employment support allowance or the rest of it because they do not fulfill the criteria, whatever those criteria may be at one point. That will inevitably happen with a significant proportion of those three million. Now, there are political and administrative choices to be made as to, you know, as to what sort of errors you want to make. Do you want to be relatively liberal and let in you know, some people who you might otherwise not have wanted to, or people who actually don't fulfill the criteria but are prepared to tick a box on the form? Or do you want to be quite strict and make sure that, uh, um, uh, that, that you're only giving it to people who you want to give it to? recognizing that that will exclude some people who simply, for whatever reason, can't demonstrate. That is a, uh, both a bureaucratic and political choice and an administrative choice. And as I've said uh, previously, you know, inevitably with systems like this, you're going to annoy, you're going to, there will be hard cases on both sides of the line. If we have a very light touch online system, as David says, well, we can do that. But that will mean that a bunch of people will get in fraudulently or improperly that will allow to stay people who have, for example, criminal records that we don't pick up through the system. Um, if you're prepared to deal with the Daily Mail and Daily Express headlines that will come out of that, then that's fine. Equally, the other end of the spectrum, if we insist on making people demonstrate residence over a period of time, you know, David says it's relatively easy to show you've been employed. Well, it is for some people, but not for others. We will end up inevitably denying residence to some perfectly good, upstanding, hard-working citizens. That's pretty much inevitable, whatever you do, because you're dealing with a very large number of people, and bureaucrats and computers are fallible. Jonathan is over-complicating the <laughs> argument about the principle of what we're trying to do, because there is an enormously broad consensus which almost all mainstream voices hold of what we are trying to do. And um, helpfully, it was the, the Vote Leave campaign expressed it in two sentences um, during their campaign. No change for EU citizens already lawfully resident in the UK. That's the principle of what we're trying to do. Um, 
their proposal was grant indefinite leave to remain and treat no less favourably than at, than at present. So that's what we're trying to do. It's enormously complex to, to do it. Um, the distribution of EU nationals is very different from the distribution of other migrants to Britain. They are spread much more broadly around the country into Lincolnshire and Merthyr Tidville and everywhere that the post-2004 wave went, whereas um, uh, otherwise migration has been a more, you know, a more urban phenomenon. And these people have never needed immigration advice particularly for the most part, and they've never had it. And so there are no advice services or uh, legal uh, opportunities for those who need it. There's a great deal of goodwill from all of the employers and the trade unions to help people with advice, etc. but they don't know what to say. So they're a big task, but there isn't a difficulty about the principle we're trying to apply. Okay. Right. Mark, Mark Durkham was next. Yeah. Well, just to go back to the um, permanent residence, uh, system. So we've heard something of, 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 of some of the flaws uh, there. Um, and we saw Mr. Catwella in the British Future uh, report that you recognise that if, if that was the option that was to be pursued, there could be some uh, time uh, in processing all of the possible EU nationals in the UK. Uh, rather than just telling us what the main flaws of the system are, what are the practical remedies? The best, the best solution is to ask the people who've got five years' residence to come forward first and give them a light-touch local thing using the current network of local <coughs> nationality checking services and boosting it up. It's not currently in Northern Ireland. It's in other places. It's not in all the right places to do this. But or some process like that where you go into your documents, someone who's skilled to do it checks them. If you need to get something else, you go home and get it. Um, you keep your passport. You don't, you know, unable to travel and so on. Uh, if it's a complicated case, then it can go into you know, something the Home Office is going to do at a national level. We need a couple of things to happen for this to work in terms of the points Jonathan has made. We, we do need, I think, the Ministry of Justice to provide a list of people that we are intentionally excluding. Um, and there are, there are detailed Home Office uh, current policies about who we exclude from settlement and indefinite. And so there's a, there's a standard we would, we would apply. And obviously, that's a difficult thing to get right. And if you get it wrong, you'll face a lot of media pressure. But you would hope that we can identify the people we've sent to prison for long periods and <coughs> identify who they are. The other biggest change that would make a massive difference is to say that local authorities have access to the HMRC and the DWP records. If you pass a regulation that lets them be used for this purpose and therefore if what somebody has been doing is working in paid employment for employer for 15 years and you've got their record then they can get the green stamp. You need the Home Office oversight of that, how that is working, you know, do people go and check that, sign that off, how does the rubber stamping work, but there are ways to clear the books of say 2 million of the 3 million cases. You've then got a decision to make about the people who on Brexit day might have two years residence, not five years residence. Yeah. Do you immediately treat two years as five years if you're in this exceptional group of this date? Or do you let people come forward over the next three years? Having given them a, a provisional status, they then acquire a full status at five years. So I think it's a, a practical approach like that. Won't you know, we'll still have issues of people whose employers never paid any national insurance and we're trying to work out who was involved. And they'll be complicated and hard cases, but we shouldn't put a couple of million people who want a, a, you know, a low-hassle system there. We should also, I think, cap the cost of it, because permanent residence is £65. Indefinite leave to remain for a non-EU uh, person is over £1,800 per person. We should be capping the costs of it around the cost for a British person getting a first passport. I think that would be, that would be a fair way to deal with this issue that has to be dealt with for people who have no expectation of being in this position. Mm -hmm. And you would mentioned earlier about essentially this being uh, potentially a reset moment. So would you see all of those things <coughs> having to be uh, achieved and in place uh, for Brexit uh, day one, or do you see this as uh, a series of model through, make do uh, options that we're likely to end up with? I think we want to be processing it, and so the people who already had five years, we should be getting on with it. We don't want to hit a massive job in two years' time. Um, our, our inquiry proposed Article 50, um, the day of it, as, as, as the cut-off for the guarantee. 
because in order to you know, make the guarantee, you also make the cutoff later on. So before we have a complex set of negotiations about future policies, transition agreements, etc., we've guaranteed the group who we had an ethical responsibility to. There is then a practical question of what you do with someone who arrives a year from now mm. to exercise their free movement rights. They're in an analogous position to somebody on a one-year visa, and you know their employers will be talking about you know certainty for them. But that that is a that is a different practical issue of the transition out of the European Union. So I think I think getting this system up and running and letting people know what it is would be very very good psychologically for the certainty and very helpful, I think, for the process of government getting it right. Mm -hmm. the, you mentioned uh, the point that, uh, in terms of what you would see as some of the options, that those aren't currently available in Northern Ireland in terms of mm -hmm. the local accessible uh, option. And uh, because of different administrative arrangements, <coughs> yeah. some of what you had suggested might be done in terms of the access to information and all the rest that might not be as immediately available in the context of Northern Ireland. Uh, so it's, it's one to know whether or not you have any answers to those challenges, but also you did mention the point that uh, there could be complicated cases. And as a border MP in Northern Ireland, my experience, for instance, in relation to tax credits is any cross-border worker is deemed as a complex case, and therefore it becomes more complicated. So. Uh, have you given have any of the, the, the witnesses given much thought to the uh, particular complications that could arise in these sorts of transitional sensitivities <coughs> for uh, uh, EU uh, citizens who are resident in the border areas, uh, such as in the northwest of Ireland, who are actually cross-border workers? Um, I think I think the delivery mechanism issue is you know let's something should be created. I mean people can pay to use these checking services, and so you know there, there, there could be a way to finance it well. But but more capacity into that I think is important. I mean in terms of Ireland, Irish citizens, and Northern Ireland, you know, there's a different set. So in this in this instance, this is a less complicated issue. Lots of other questions are more complicated. In terms of um, Polish citizens in Ireland, um, I, I don't I don't think it's particularly I don't think it's particularly different other than finding a a pragmatic way to process it. Well, let's make sure that things like the 450-day rule, for instance, or whatever, aren't, yes, yes, uh, yes. don't end, end up tripping uh, an <coughs> EU national who isn't uh, a British or Irish citizen who has been working on a cross-border basis and maybe has, has moved across the border, or indeed their firm, their work has moved mm -hmm. uh, across the border in, in that period. <coughs> and sometimes when there are those tests around things like the 450-day yeah. rule, and sometimes uh, the problem arises because it's the Irish tax authorities uh, are raising questions about exactly what time has been spent on either side of the border. So some of the uh, answers that have been given to the overall problem that we're hearing about uh, may fail to address the particular point about uh, cross-border workers in the dairy, particularly if in Northern Ireland, particularly if they are in Northern Ireland or in the uh, Republic, uh, if they are uh, EU nationals other than Irish or UK citizens, and that that will affect your, you know, your getting that right will affect your right to reside and settle in all parts of the United Kingdom. Um, I mean, there's a there's a broad assumption that everybody is in favour of, you know, continued free movement between the Irish Republic and the United Kingdom, or need some permission from the European Union. The common travel area only yeah. applies to British yeah. and Irish yeah, citizens. Yeah, but but the but no, but the, but the, the right of Irish residents. The right of Irish residents to work and live in the UK, you know, is the pre ECU thing. It's the yeah, yeah, but that's about EU nationals. Yeah. You know, yeah, so you might need to make, you, you're, you're right, there might be EU specific. Who are in my constituency, yeah. resident or indeed yeah. working in my constituency while living in the next door constituency of Donegal. The residents, the residents across the border, you might need to make a special um, requirement for, uh, which will be in the spirit, I think, of what is trying to be done. So that any reset around permanent residence should. Yeah. take account of their particular circumstances. Yeah. Okay. Peter Lilly, I think you wanted to come in on this point. Peter. Yes, please. I mean, we, we've got to deal with this. Uh, I agree with Johnson that even for the DWP, which has experience of dealing with millions of people, a new category of three million people is a very daunting bureaucratic process. It seems to me the easiest way, or the way to minimise the difficulties, will be get, to give access to DWP data and HMRC data. But then that immediately raises the one issue where I'm uncertain no one's actually talked about. What about people who've been here legally but have been working without paying taxes and therefore haven't been uh, exercising their national insurance number? They may have a national insurance number, 
but it won't show up in the uh, DWP figures and it won't show up in the HMRC figures. What do we say about them? Do they have the right to remain even though they've been here without, as it were, paying their dues or not? I think this is an extremely good question, um, and uh, you know, it's partly um, a political question for, for you and, and the country as a whole, and it's partly a, an administrative question, of course, because by definition, these people will not necessarily be able to, you know, as you say, they may have been here perfectly legally as European Union citizens, exercising their free movement rights. They may have been working and indeed contributing to the economy in, in the broader sense, um, but uh, either because they were deliberately defrauding the British state by uh, not paying their taxes, which may be one thing from a moral or political point of view, or because their employers have chosen to defraud the British state, um, which may of course be through no fault of their own. Um, uh, they may not show up on, on the records. Um, and I think that you know, this is in, you know, th again, it will be possible to come up with, with, with workarounds uh, 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 for some at least of this group um, but uh, we will have to take there will have to be a sort of political decision as to how liberal we want to be um, and, and what sort of standards of proof or self-attestation we regard as being acceptable um, and, and as to whether we, we think from a sort of moral or political point of view we do actually want to give these people uh, um, in that position the right to say. Um, and, I, and, and as I sort of implied, you know, you can certainly make a decent political case for saying that people were here, even if they were here legally, but were dodging their taxes, don't have any particular moral claims on us. Equally, you can say that for many of these people, it won't have been their choice. They may, may have been their employer who was choosing to, to, uh, to, to disobey the law. Um, and for those people, I would assume that we would want to find some accommodation, and some of those people will, of course, have um, have, have various connections or ties, family or otherwise, to this country now. I agree with what Jonathan um, says about the political choice and also the distinction between, you know, if somebody is self-employed and you can see very clearly they've deliberately not paid their taxes, you can decide whether to refuse them or whether to make them make a settlement with the revenue. Um, the grey area between somebody who can claim it's employer exploitation, whether there be a lot of sympathy, is important. A third factor which is important to this question and to the future policy question is it's then not in our interests. To, depending on what's going to happen in terms of people who don't give status to, it's not in our interest to have a, a large um, grey area of going on working off the books. And so if you can find ways to put people in the system that, that are fair and that have public and political consent, that, that, would, be, that would be very good. But I think, I think being quite clear about, you know, if there's cases of exploitation or if there's cases of people evading their taxes, they are, they are different types of case and there'll be a blurred boundary yeah. between them. And they may, I mean, we may be talking about individuals here who are married to or whose partners are British nationals and they have British children. So, I mean, just to, to add to the layers of complication, so well, how is the system going to deal with that in those circumstances? Um, Mark, yes, yeah, please. Just going back to the point was mentioned earlier in terms of, and it, was, and, uh, it came up in one of your own questions, Chair, the question of the uh, comprehensive health uh, insurance, and, and Mr. Carvalho mentioned that there's differential awareness uh, around that. Uh, we've had some previous witnesses who have said that comprehensive health insurance doesn't actually exist in the insurance world. So whatever about the differential awareness, is this a rigorous figment? Uh, I mean, is it uh, a reasonable or necessary requirement? I, th I think the context is, is different as to what the government was trying to do and it wanted to make this change in 2004 and its implications now if we were to refuse people on this on this basis, but but certainly I think the level of information that was there in 2004 was incredibly patchy, and it only really went to um, accession people from accession states uh, to a large to a large extent. So I think I think I think it's a it's now a big spoke in the wheel, and the the, the benefits of saying you know we want to be clear about access to our health services and so on are much lower than the way in which it will just put a lot of people in appeals processes, um, and then you'll probably grant them for other reasons, such as family rights. So I think I think not health insurance for different types of, um, you know, person coming into the UK, student, self-sufficient people, self-employed people is, is a future policy question. So I, I think we should separate out in terms of the stock of the EEA nationals. I'm not, I'm not Mr. Goodhart, what please. does draw attention to is just sort of in a way how laissez-faire our system has been, you know, over hundreds of years, in fact, and that, I mean, as part of this general reform, I think we are going to have to reopen the debate about 
ID card or, or population register, particularly if we are going to have a, a relatively light touch initially when it comes to processing people for permanent residence, there will be lots of <coughs> anomalous cases. And, you know, I mean, one of the reasons for, um, for large scale anxiety about large scale Im immigration is anxiety about free riding, about people uh, having access to. To, to the social state when they haven't paid in sufficiently. Um, and some kind of um, um, entitlement um, cards, uh, some kind of uh, ability relatively easily to prove that <coughs> you, do, you do indeed qualify for access to the British social state, I think is we're going to have to think about. There's one other point that <coughs> I think <coughs> the government's position <coughs> is not currently clear, and maybe the committee can illuminate it um, in, in the period to come. Um, EU workers are covered. The family and dependents of EU workers are covered. And it's not entirely clear from some of the reports we've seen as to what the government believes the position to be in regard to the EU dependents of British nationals who are not free movement individuals. Now, the legal expertise and advice is these people are covered anyway and shouldn't make that distinction. But in terms of letters that are currently going out from the Home Office, um, sometimes an EU national who hasn't got the comprehensive uh, health insurance is being sent uh, advice to leave the country evidently by mistake. They don't know that and they're very anxious because obviously the government's policy is your status hasn't changed and you're being sent a letter saying you now need to make preparations to leave. Um, and you know, hopefully ministers will be able to assure you that those template letters for non-EU are not going to EU nationals. That's an odds with government policy. But there are a couple of cases that have been reported, such as uh, a Dutch woman who's lived here 20, 30 years, married to a British national, where it seemed quite deliberate that the British government was saying, um, we don't know what your legal status is, you know, you might want to go to Holland and apply from there. And it would be really odd if, um, if the EU partners, dependents of British nationals were not treated as well as the EU dependents of EU nationals. And it would also be at odds, I think, with the case law. It would actually be a mistaken reading of the policy. There's no point for the law saying these people are in if the Home Office thinks they aren't. So I, I hope you can pin them down on that and, and you know, get a guarantee that that group is, is going to be included. I, I, I've come across people who are very worried about that, you know, their, their family are in that case. Okay. Thank you. Peter Grant. Thank you, Jeremy. Good morning. Gentlemen, David, I'd like to start with you first. Um, I'm particularly interested <coughs> to explore some of the suggestions in the paper you produced in August 2016. First of all, what kind of response has that had? Have you had any official or unofficial comment from the government as to how they view any of those ideas? To, to the, pay, the policy change, <coughs> um, no, alas, no official response. Um, An unofficial response? I'm not asking you what it is. But no. <laughs> It must be very <coughs> depressing to spend so much time putting these erudite thoughts down in the old debates. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 quite a few people um, uh, have read it. Uh, I mean, that's the main thing. Um. OK, can I start by the, the comments you've made, that I suppose following on from the discussion we just had, about the, the status of EU citizens who've been here for a long time, <coughs> who almost certainly would qualify for UK citizenship if they wanted to apply for it. A new suggestion, first of all, although you haven't made it explicit, is it reasonable to assume that what you're suggesting we should be looking to arrange now for EU nationals who are in the UK, we would expect EU countries to make the same arrangements for yeah. UK yeah. citizens yeah. over there, so there would be a degree of reciprocity at some point. Is it correct to say that your suggestion <coughs> is that whether our EU nationals who have lived here for a long time to qualify for UK citizenship, we should be encouraging them to take that up, possibly by making it easy for them to apply. Yes, I think that's, I think that's right. Um, <coughs> I mean, we've, it, we, we don't know um, what the situation is in terms of what one might call kind of integration of European Union citizens. I mean, I think, um, you know, what proportion really have sort of settled and, and dug roots here and, uh, you know, if not themselves, perhaps their children regard themselves as, as British, what proportion are 
um, sort of commute room. That's why we have to leave our live coverage from the select committee rooms. You can continue watching the session online on our website at bbc.co.uk slash parliaments. the way they vote and things like that, and also the role of UCREP and CORAPA in relation to that, um, which are immensely important because uh, some people are under a severe misunderstanding uh, that there is more majority voting that actually, takes, that actually takes place, as you know. A lot of this is done by consensus, and therefore some people would argue, and I certainly would be one of them, that uh, decisions taken behind closed doors are not the most democratic way of uh, passing legislation on the scale that pours into the United Kingdom Parliament and therefore to the people, which of course is highly relevant to the questions we're discussing on the floor of the House today with the withdrawal bill. Um, but also, I'll be asking you later some questions of a more personal nature regarding uh, your resignation and things of that kind. So um, first of all, I'm going to ask Kate Green, she'd ask the first question. Good Chair, good morning Sir Ivan, and um, thank you for coming. Um, could I start by asking you about the negotiations process? Um, you, you've had an extensive experience of leading negotiations. What do you think are the key things that are needed to make negotiations, international negotiations, successful? Well, first of all, good morning and thank you very much for the uh, invitation to uh, 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 attend this committee. Um, well, I, indeed, I do have ex extensive uh, experience of negotiations, both G8 and G20, as well as the EU. Um, I'd have to say, I think it, uh, you know, obviously you develop as a negotiator your own views on how you negotiate and the best way in which to deliver results in negotiating. And one of the things I've consistently said to all my staff, both here and in UCREP, if you, ha you have to develop a negotiating style with which you feel comfortable. Um, and different people and different permanent representatives have had very different styles over the years. Um, I, I think in a negotiation like this, this is, uh, depending on the ambit of the uh, negotiation we're talking about, if we, if we get onto a broader trade and economic negotiation for what is our future status outside the European Union and our relationship with the European Union, this will be an unprecedentedly large negotiation covering large tracts of Whitehall huge, uh, huge tracts of the existing acquis and you know, our destination is to be defined by the government and by this house and by, uh, by the other house. And so it's a, it's a negotiation on a scale that we haven't experienced, um, well probably ever, but certainly since the Second World War. So I think there's always a danger in generalising from specific experience that I've had, say, in a budgetary negotiation or in tax negotiations or in uh, negotiations around JHA issues. They all have a specificity to them. This is going to be, on a humongous scale, going to have enormous amounts of uh, business running up various different channels. Um, and then involve difficult trade-offs for Her Majesty's Government and difficult trade-offs for the other 27 on the other side of the table. The key to any successful negotiation in the end is that both sides are invested in trying to find a solution to it and both sides, you know, and, uh, I then don't want to sound naive, obviously I would expect us and the 27 to be coming um, at this from very different uh, angles and with very different objectives, but negotiations ultimately only culminate in deals if uh, there is a determination on both sides of the uh, both sides of the table to make progress, uh, and that involves generating momentum and generating an atmosphere, so that even when you get into um, name calling and um, uh, you know uh, an extremely feisty atmosphere, and we undoubtedly will in both exit negotiations and future trade and economic negotiations, there is still an appetite to proceed and finalise agreements. Trade negotiations, at the risk of sounding rather glib, trade negotiations always start with people making um, you know, pious and pro-free trading um, uh, comments, usually on both sides of the table. They usually end up in a, in a fairly mercantilist fist fight, uh, but then you know, most of them resolve themselves and end up with trade deals, not all by any means, but um, they, go th they go through phases. And, and how much would you say 
um, that international negotiations depend on the sort of multilateral relationships and how much on negotiations with individual countries. Well, again, it varies enormously, and we'll see. Um, you know, we're in the fairly war period at the moment on both sides of the channel. No negotiations started. The players aren't on the pitch. Um, when they are on the pitch, the, the 27 will have to organise themselves, and they're in the process of organising themselves. And you've seen already at leader level and at Sherpa level, um, uh, they are organising themselves in order to be able to negotiate with us. And they'll have a huge internal negotiation to, to go through. I think this is not widely enough understood in this country, that the 27 will spend an awful lot of time debating with each other and producing agreed lines and agreed mandates for their own negotiator. The Commission will be their negotiator, but the 27 will have in each area to thrash out um, you know, a common position which they then want to discuss with the, with the British when the British are in the room. And this is immensely complex. One of the reasons why the EU is tortuous and can be very slow on trade deals is, is precisely that. I mean, I've been in the room negotiating on behalf of the UK or, or speaking on behalf of the UK on the negotiation of trade mandates. This is difficult stuff. All 27 start with different objectives and different priorities and bring those to the table. And there's an internal negotiation to be gone through amongst the 27 before they reach a position. Now, there's a huge question for this country as to how much you invest in the relationship with the institutions and the, the key people at the Brussels end and how much you invest in uh, you know, specific capitals and which capitals and how to do it. Um, you know, that's, uh, that's a very complex equation. The, 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 the real answer is you have to do both, and intensively, and repeatedly. How important is confidentiality in that process, and how much could be, as it were, publicly understood, and is it helpful for certain matters to be understood publicly? Uh, very difficult question. I suspect we'll, in this negotiation, but um, you know, as I say, it's not yet underway, um, confidentiality will be, uh, how can I put this, at a premium. I think an awful lot will leak. Brussels is very leaky and all the institutions are very leaky. Um, uh, no disrespect to them, but I'm afraid that's the, and, and as I say, in the compilation of positions by the 27, um, on the basis of papers from, from, from the Commission, uh, stuff will get out and incessantly, in my view. So I think you should all expect an awful lot of this negotiation to be conducted very publicly. Um, that doesn't always help as a negotiator, obviously. I mean, I totally understand, Sir Bill, when we come to the, um, uh, the questions of, um, uh, uh, that, you, that you raised right at the outset, um, that there is, a, there is a tension between the need sometimes of a negotiator to have confidentiality and to be able to engage and explore options behind the scenes without those being divulged and getting out, and the desirability of having full transparency to this House and indeed to uh, you know, parliaments across the 27 and the European Parliament, all of whom will have a, a, a role in, in the process to come. I mean, um I took the view, um, as I said just now, that I will leave some of the more personal questions to a bit later, but um, you said that it was going to take 10 years. Uh, can you confirm whether, in fact, you actually said that, um, or was that meant to be, um, a, was it a leak, was it uh, a, an intention uh, that you thought to be able to um, uh, get across a message without... Um, anyone really knowing quite what was, where it came from? I mean, can, can you give us a bit more information on that? Uh, I can indeed. I, I never said it would take 10 years. Um, what I did report um, repeatedly and have reported, and it, um, let me just search for uh, um, an exact form of words because I uh, wrote down what I wrote, so I can yet find it. Um, what I said was that if you talk to the senior people in uh, both the Commission and the Council Secretariat um, and the key member states, both in capitals and in Brussels, their assessment would be that any trade and economic negotiation would be a single negotiation encompassing vast areas of the acquis. We can come on to that in more detail. That that in itself would probably only start late in 2017, if then. 
and that all experience of previous FTA negotiations, the Prime Minister has now made clear that she, uh, she thinks her intended destination is uh, some sort of free trade agreement. If you look at the record of previous uh, FTAs the EU has negotiated, it has taken an awful lot of time an awful lot of time from the inception of those negotiations to the conclusion of them, and there is then a ratification process. So I think what I put in print, as I say, I, I, I have the formula here somewhere, but I'm not sure I can lay my hands on it. What I put in print was that my summary of the senior beltway wisdom from the people I talk to on a daily basis was that the combination of a negotiation on the FTA and a ratification process in all 28 member state parliaments, the European Parliament and some regional parliaments, you've all just seen the Canadian Wallonian experience, would probably take until the early mid-2020s for ratification. So I think those were, uh, those were my exact words. There's then a question about, are we talking about mixed agreement? So does it require ratification in all the very, very complex legal questions to be gone through, which are probably too complex to be gone into here. But I never used 10 years. What I did, which I think is what ambassadors are partly there for, is to report what I was getting from the most senior voices around Brussels, both at commissioner level, senior official level inside all the institutions, and uh, from key opposite numbers in the member states. And I have not found a single uh, person at a senior level in any of those uh, organs who's diverged from that essential view. Now, I can come on later in the, in, in the evidence uh, process to explain what my retort to that is, why I have been saying to people I think it's possible to go much faster with the UK. Um, you know, I can explain what my reasoning would be then in how we would rebut that and how we would try and persuade European colleagues to go faster than that. But the consensus wisdom amongst the kind of technocracy around Brussels and around capitals is that FTAs take a long time. Um, and that even with the best will in the world, if you got that negotiation off to a quick start during the second half of 2017, it wouldn't culminate by October 2018. I can only, sum I can only give you a very honest summary of the wisdom that I get from others. I mean, th this was reported by the BBC, of course, and um, uh, it was on, dated the 15th of December, uh, which was the day on which I wrote to you because I was yeah. concerned about this um, and asked if you would come and see us. We didn't get any reply. Uh, at all, um, and then we had to follow that up uh, with a further letter, of course, uh, in January. But could I um, ask you this? Uh, is this uh, reporting by the BBC based on off-the-record uh, remarks and observations that you made to them? No. It isn't? No. And where do you think it came from? I have no idea. Um, I, uh uh, it was, uh, I know the origin of it in terms of which bit of text from me it comes from, and I've just given you the more accurate account of what that bit of text said, and I wrote that before the October European Council for the Prime Minister's first European Council appearance. I mean, so the route by which it got to the BBC for December the 15th, which I think was the day of the uh, European Council, and the issue exploded, and I was all over the screens uh, on, the, on the 15th, why it took two months to get there, and by what route it got there, I, could, I couldn't possibly say. But to be, to be very clear, I never, uh, I never leak, I never, uh, I never have, never would, uh, never have under any government, and uh, I, uh, this is... The origin of this has nothing whatever to do with me. Well, I only add that um, in the report it says that Downing Street said he was relaying other members' views rather than his own or the British government, yeah. which strongly suggests that they thought that you were, in fact, relaying these views yourself. And secondly, a spokesman is alleged to have said it is wrong to suggest that this was advice from our ambassadors to the EU. Like all ambassadors, part of his role is to report the views of others. So, I mean, on the face of it, it would appear that there is a, a view that uh, somehow or other you were involved in uh, presenting that information. But I, I take what well, you said. Well, I can categorically deny and rebut that. I have uh, no part of relaying that information. This was a confidential letter from me of the 14th of October, I believe. Uh, in which I uh, set out for the new Prime Minister at her first European Council at quite some length. What I always did in, in advance of all European Councils was to write a, a fairly voluminous, I'm fairly notorious for writing at length, uh, a voluminous scene-setter, as they're called in the trade, 
and part of that scene setter was to uh, was to try and set out what I thought uh, the prevailing wisdom was on Brexit, both process and substance. Um, and uh, as I say, my my recollection of that of that was uh, that came from a specific chunk of that letter of the 14th of October. I copied that in exactly the usual way to uh, relatively few people in key offices uh, in Whitehall. Uh, and I've no idea why then, two months later, it should, then, uh, it should then emerge. But what I said then is that if I were pressed to elaborate on where I thought the street wisdom was amongst the senior players, most would forecast that the conclusion would be some sort of FTA deal because they'd read the Prime Minister's speech at, at party conference. Uh, they had concluded from that by what she said, both on borders and on jurisdictional questions, that we couldn't possibly stay in the single market or stay in the customs union, and that therefore where we were headed was some sort of deep and comprehensive free trade deal. And as I said in my earlier remarks, the general view, which I think I can uh, help the committee in trying to rebut and unpick, is that process, a combination of the negotiation process for a deep and comprehensive FTA, which would be the most com complex and comprehensive FTA ever negotiated between two negotiating partners, if that's where we go. It would be much more. To give you an example, uh, Chairman, uh, the EU-South Korea deal um, took about three and a half years to negotiate. You could argue it took much longer than that to get to the starting line, but from the starting line to the conclusion of the negotiation was three and a half years. That's sadly quite rapid by European Union standards. That document is 1,400 pages of legal prose and then 60 or 70 ancillary pages of a political agreement. The EU-Canada document is even longer than that. I think it's about 1,600 pages of legal prose. You do not, uh, with the European Union, at the speed at which the European Union and its member states move, easily negotiate something of that gravity and length in a very short space of time. So EU-South Korea took about three and a half years from inception to conclusion. Right, Richard Drax. So, uh, good morning. Um, it certainly convinced me that I was right to leave the EU. Um, with what I've heard so far, I have to say. Um, may I just ask you then, one key thing in these fusion negotiations is what falls to, to be negotiated within Article 50. Is it just the division of property and liabilities? Is it the future relationship to the UK and the EU? And how does one sequence these negotiations properly? Uh, well, thank you for that. I mean, on, on, on uh, your fir first point about a reason for leaving the EU, that is, that is of course. I mean, that is, the, 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 the case for one of, one of the key cases for leaving is, is the nimbleness and the agility that we would have as a single, member, a single member state or not a member state on our own to negotiate at speed with any of our negotiating priorities on the table. I am I mean, no doubt that we will negotiate FTAs with other partners outside the EU faster than the EU could do. No doubt at all. And I want to put that unequivocally on the record. Uh, that's my view. The question is obviously then the negotiating heft you have at the table in comparison with being part of a wider bloc. The advantage of being in the EU is not speed or nimbleness. Nobody has ever accused the EU and its member states of speed and nimbleness on trade negotiations. It's the size of the market that they have. Why are the Canadians or the South Koreans or other partners interested in the EU market? It's sheer size and scale. Why did the Canadians not walk away from the table over Wallonia and other things? Um, so I hope that's an exp explanation. Evidently, post-exit, when we have our own trade negotiating team and our, uh, and our ability to negotiate, we will negotiate with other third countries faster than. So to come to your, um, come to your question, this is of course uh, going to be the first argument between uh, the UK and the other side of the table. And you're already seeing from Michel Barnier's statements, I don't have them with me, that the interpretation that the Commission and I think the 27, if you look at the um, language from other member states is putting out, suggests a clear sequencing that Article 50 is purely about the withdrawal and exit process and agreeing a withdrawal treaty, and that only after we'd withdrawn could we get to the trade and economic negotiation um, and uh, the mandate that the 27 would agree for that negotiation with us. That, as you know, is not the British government's view, and it's not our reading of what Article 50 says. 
but it hinges on your reading of uh, taking account of the framework for its future relationship with the Union. So if I could summarise what I, again, and this is me as um, ex-diplomat, um, not that I was a, a diplomat, as you know, a treasury man by origin, um, but as an ex-diplomat describing where the other um, uh, 27 are coming from and what they think the, negotiation, the next negotiation is about, I think they think it's about five things. Um, they think it's about disentanglement of the UK from the EU budget and the financial liabilities question. Uh, they uh, think it's about the acquired rights issue, um, that's EU citizens here and UK citizens elsewhere, and what will their rights be post-exit and how will those rights be, you know, will those rights be sort of frozen in aspect for a specific number of people on the basis of their status at the point of exit and how are they then refreshed thereafter. They think it's about the really tedious stuff which of course always gets the European Union uh, going, um, uh, where agencies are located, so for example the European Banking Agency or the European Medicines Agency currently located in the UK, those will uh, uh, leave and there will be a, no doubt a huge bum fight about where they end up, uh, so the agencies issue. Then there is the question of the UK's, what happens um, to uh, international treaties to which the EU and its member states, including the UK, are signatories. So there are a lot of sort of legacy issues there right across the full acquis. And then the fifth issue, I think, is the core where the argument is coming, which is transitional arrangements. Um, now, I would argue and have been arguing uh, repeatedly for months. In fact, I was arguing this uh, you know, uh, in, uh, in principle well before the referendum, looking ahead to this, this possibility. I would argue that taking into account the framework means you can't really have um, a proper withdrawal treaty negotiation unless you know where you're going. And the Prime Minister has now started to articulate where she's going. There obviously would then have to be a negotiation about that. But how on earth could you, with, you draw up a withdrawal treaty without having constantly in mind where you're headed? So I have been arguing, and I'm sure we will carry on um, arguing at every level, that this is all one ball of wax and these two negotiations have to come together. You can't, uh, you can't say only deal with the withdrawal treaty, technical, legal and financial issues first and park the rest, because everything you need to decide going in the withdrawal treaty is a function of where you're going to end up at the... You know, so I start from the end. Where do we want to be? I think we are um, uh, getting clarity that where we want to be is in a free trading relationship with the European Union outside, but not, not subject to supranational uh, jurisdiction and with control over our borders. And then there are obviously big questions about money and contributions and, uh, and for what and over what period. But it seems to me inevitable that these two negotiations in the end have to collide. But if you asked all my opposite numbers in Brussels at the moment, and they asked the institutions at the moment, and indeed read Michel Barnier's script at the moment, uh, the constant repetition is, no, we deal first with the withdrawal treaty issues and only subsequently come. Um, so I think the first argument will be between um, the, the UK and the EU27 about what are we actually negotiating about. So, can, so can I just quickly ask problem. you to uh, look by the liabilities. <clears throat> we, we hear threats, and I can only assume they are threats, that's how I interpret them, of having to pay billions of pounds or euros to leave this club. Well, so far as joining a club, you pay a membership fee, then you pay every year to be a member, and then you leave. You don't pay to leave a club. You, you say, thank you very much, and you, and you head off. So do you think this is a genuine and real threat to us to pay all these billions of euros to a club that we're leaving, or do you think that's an unreasonable request to make at this stage? I think it can be both genuine and unreasonable, if I, if I may say so. I think it is genuine, and uh, I hear it repeatedly and have been reporting it uh, uh, for months. And you've seen the, co the coverage in uh, various of our own newspapers, so it is being said, and openly, by Commissioner Barnier and others in the Commission, that the total fi financial liability, as they, as they see it, uh, might be in the order of 40 to 60 billion euros on exit. I think they do believe that. I think I can help try, I mean, I don't know the origin of that figure, but I think I can guess it. I am a bit of a budget bore and expert, so I think I can guess where they're coming from and why they're going to mount up that figure. I think that's a predictably very hard line coming from 
uh, the Commission and some in the European Parliament and from some member states. Um, we will see whether uh, when the member states get together, they sustain that position, go as hard line as that, plonk that number on the table and then see whether that's a genuine pitch or just an opening bid. But is there a big financial issue and financial debate coming about whether we owe anything on exit? Yes, there is. I can assure you of that. Presumably we could just be hard line too and say, well, we probably won't be paying it. Mm. Indeed. Um, and that gets you into the question, uh, which I think will come at some point this year, but not for, not for, not for me to opine, I th of uh, the realism or otherwise of, of, of threats that the negotiation in the end goes nowhere. As I say, I think the first argument will be, what are we arguing about? What are we negotiating about? I'm sorry this sounds terribly tedious and classically European Union, but it is. I think the first argument is, what are we going to argue about? And I think that will be coming... The EU27 will meet, uh, we will file, I don't, I don't know when the Prime Minister has in mind to um, uh, file the Article 50 letter, but the process then will be that the 27 will meet at leader level. I can't tell you whether that will be before the French presidential elections or afterwards. When I was still um, uh, in UPREP, I had assumed that it would probably come <laughs> after the second round of the French elections. The 27 would meet, and they, as you know, under the Article 50 process, uh, they draw up the guidelines. The Article 50 process is not really a balanced process between the 1 and the 27. The 27 are rather in charge of the process and set the parameters for the process and set their own uh, guidelines. I think they would then set some rather, uh, say some rather predictable things. They've already foreshadowed some of those things in what they said on June the 29th and what they repeated at the December European Council. Um, Interesting question as to, at that point, will they put financial liabilities on the table? Probably, in some fashion, but I think they won't stick a, stick a number on there. I think, again, I can come to this later in my testimony if it's helpful, and it's obviously extremely difficult to generalise um, and dangerous to generalise. I think the view from many will be that the implications for the UK of walking away without any deal on the economic side without any preferential agreement and walking into a WTO-only world are, uh, from their perspective, which may be a misreading of us, so unpalatable that we won't do it. Um, uh, but I think that will become a major question during 2007. But I think the calculation on the other side will be uh, that the UK will see that it's in its interest in a whole plethora of areas to have a future preferential deal with the EU, e, with the EU um, and that that will oblige us to think seriously about transitional arrangements which bridge us to that deal and that a unilateral abrogation or a desire simply to walk away from the table and say, well, if you're sticking liabilities of that sort on the table, we're not playing, is not a route that uh, they think we will take. Sorry, sorry, just one final little point. So you don't think... I think what you said is that all the officials will sit down uh, and, and politicians and say, what is best for the many hundreds of millions of people in Europe, of which we are still very much a friend and ally, let's come to a deal that actually serves them best, because we are representing them, rather than play silly political games. You think there's no chance of pragmatism, sanity, common sense predominating in these debates. Well, I'm tempted to give an unduly cynical answer to that, but uh, I'll, 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 I'll refrain from doing so. No, look, I think there are, are, are serious-minded um, uh, people on you know, all sides here who think this is an extraordinarily important discussion to be, to be had. They may regret that the UK is leaving the European Union, but they want a close relationship with the UK, and they will be serious about trying to negotiate an outcome. So I don't want to sound you know, unduly said. I think that's particularly true in the member states, but it's also true in the institutions. And I have lots of people I've known for many years across the institutions who profoundly care about this and will want a serious process and will not want a kind of disorderly and abrupt exit or a, an inflammatory sort of set of discussions getting out of control. So I don't want to be... Equally, I think it's important that you all understand that from a, an EU perspective, however much 
we dispute this and would not view it and understand exactly what you're saying about financial liability stopping when you leave the club. They will think, they do think, many have said to me, um, you've exploded a bomb underneath the multi-annual financial framework. As you know, that's a seven-year framework which runs from 2014 to 2020 and I was heavily in engaged in negotiating it in 2011, 12, 13. Uh, it's a seven-year, you know, and I won't get into the intricacies of EU budgeting, but it's a seven-year process. The mere fact of our exiting during um, the period of the framework causes them immense financial difficulty. That's part of the leverage that we may have in these negotiations, depending on what we're prepared to do. So, for example, one opposite number, I won't cite the member state, uh, but it was from a, um, a poorer Central and Eastern European member state, a uh, permanent representative said to me, if you leave and cease to pay your dues, which I, of course, said, well, they're not our dues because we'd have left, so we don't have any financial liabilities at that point, the reality for them on the ground in unnamed capital is they have told their people that structural funds receipts of quantum X will be available until 2020. And that figure, merely by the dint of UK exit and us not paying anymore, is diminished by 10 or 12%. So they've got to go to their own citizens and say, whoops, when I said you were going to get 100, you're going to get 88. Now, I have said, uh, I don't want to divulge the advice I've given to you know, this Prime Minister or previous Prime Ministers, but it's fairly obvious. I, I've said I think one of the big issues in the next couple of years as the 27 approach this negotiation is they've now got a big hole in their budget before uh, the end of the MFF period. You, now, you may think, well, this is great from our point of view because it divides the net contributors, the, you know, the Germans, the French, the Netherlands, the Nordics, uh, and others from the Southerners. But, of course, one thing they can all agree on is that we are the rogues who have ceased to, to pay our dues. So um, uh, if you're a poor Southern member state, obviously you're hoping that if the UK disappears and fails to pay its liabilities at that point, the German taxpayer will step in, or the French taxpayer, or the uh, Netherlands taxpayer, but you may, that hope may be quite rapidly disappointed. If you're the German taxpayer, you're saying, you know, why should we be on the hook for the UK having left in order to bail out southern member states to whom we're um, you know, already transferring too much? My, my point is simply this. Think of it from the angle of the 27. We have created a major issue inside the 27 with the whole that we will have created by exiting in the budget. And when you're a leader of one of those 27 coming to this table on a UK withdrawal treaty, money will be on your mind. I can't tell you that they will all stick to, you know, 40 billion, 60 billion, whichever, think of a, think of a number is coming out of, uh, you know, the commission circles. But will they care passionately about this and be raising it with the Prime Minister over the next uh, month, months? Yes. Just um, one point on the question of the relationship, not just the money. Um, the uh, summit of the 27 quite clearly stated that access to the single market, and I'm quoting, requires acceptance of all four freedoms. Mm. They know perfectly well that that is an impossibility and furthermore, they don't talk about membership of the single market because that's been discussed ad nauseum, uh, but actually access to the single market. Now, how do you interpret that? They talk about solidarity. Doesn't it really look as if on those principles that they've enunciated and already stipulated that there really isn't any chance of this deal going any further than a few months? Because if they stick up to that rule as a 27 then there is no room for discussion. No, I understand the uh, point, Chairman. I, I think that's probably too gloomy a perspective. I think they do draw a distinction between membership of the single market and what that entails. We may dislike that, but again, I'm, I'm here as, a, a, as an ex-diplomat describing the, you know, the, the wisdom of the others about what the single market consists in. And they think it consists in um, a range of rights and obligations. They think budgetary, uh, the budgetary element is part of it. They think that supranational lawmaking and supranational jurisdiction is part of it. They think state aids rules are part of it. And they think a whole range of things that we may, as, as Brits, not have thought of as intrinsic to the single market are intrinsic to the single market project. 
I've heard that repeatedly from uh, you know Frau Merkel personally over uh, over very many years. It's a single ball of wax, and you either respect all four freedoms, and you are members of the single market, and uh, you know you accept supranational jurisdiction and everything that goes with it, or you're outside the single market. And I think their doctrine will be not to. In a sense, every, everybody has access to the single market. I mean, I think it's a sort of slightly misleading uh, nomenclature. Everybody, of course, can trade with the EU. The North Koreans can trade with the EU. The question is, on what terms? And the question is, if you're in an FTA with the EU, how much worse is that for you in certain specific areas than being in a single market? We will not be in the single market. Uh, 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 that's patently clear from what the Prime Minister said. I, I've been saying, again, without revealing... Uh, uh, my advice in depth. I've been saying for ages, if that's where we are on the control of borders and on jurisdiction, manifestly we have to leave the single market. Um, uh, that will have some consequences in certain areas. I can try and give the committee some examples of that if, if it's helpful, but there will be... You know, let me perhaps give a financial services uh, example. Um, patently, if we leave the single market, um, then passporting as it's term. There is no passport, passport per se, either in primary or in secondary legislation, but of passporting in the jargon, uh, we will not benefit from passporting arrangements. That matters more to some chunks of the financial services industry than others, and it's dangerous to generalise. Then there is the question of, if you don't have passporting rights, can you rely on so-called equivalents? Um, where the EU27 can declare the arrangements of a third country, which is what we're about to become, equivalent to its own, and therefore um, uh, allow um, firms trading from the UK access on privileged terms to the EU market. The problem with equivalence, without again wishing to dive into excessive technicalities, is it's quite capricious, it's quite political, it's quite incomplete, there are various directives where there are equivalence provisions that are very important, directives where there are not equivalence provisions. And equivalence can be withdrawn relatively rapidly from um, by the 27 at relatively short notice. And if you talk to financial institutions, which I have repeatedly used to work for some financial institutions, that's a real problem for them. Because, it, as I say, it's capricious, it's unpredictable, they think it's politicised, and they think at very short notice... Um, equivalents can be withdrawn from the jurisdiction, which lands them with a huge business problem. So if I think about this now as an ordinary citizen, as it were, uh, from the outside, where would one ultimately want to go in a, in a free trade agreement with the EU? You would, you would want some sort of mutual recognition agreement, which uh, balanced between the two sides, which gives the UK more predictability, more certainty, and, and more sort of dual control over the arrangements you draw up. But that would be, I've talked to the Americans repeatedly about what dealing with the EU is like from the outside, including on equivalence arrangements on financial services, and the honest answer can be, can be extremely difficult. So we would be seeking, I hope and think in any deal that we strike over the coming years, something unprecedented for the EU, uh, where we get a deeper FTA with more provisions on financial services which benefit our own financial services uh, uh, access, but in my view also benefit the 27. I mean, part of this is persuading them the 27 it's not in their own interest to cut their own, cut their own nose off here, and there are really important questions about access to the London market and access to finance on, on proper terms that we're going to have to persuade the 27 it's in their interest to do an unprecedented deal for them on. Indeed. Uh, Alan Brown. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Uh, morning, Mr. Ivan. I was wanting to go back to timescales, I predicted timescales in terms of trying to negotiate a free trade agreement. You've correctly said the EU can be slow because of the 27 member states protecting their interests. And at the same time, one of the advantages of the UK coming out is the UK can be more nimble negotiating free trade agreements with other countries. But does that not mean the UK is competing with the EU, so how, how can the UK keep the EU focused on negotiating with the UK to get a deal on a short time scale when equally the UK is looking to make deals elsewhere where the EU will want to make the same deals with Japan, China, New Zealand, Australia? So is there not 
competing sets of vested interests, so it may therefore not be need use interest to focus on a short uh, time scale for a free trade agreement with the UK. Well, I think there are uh, several very good questions there. Um, I think there is more of an alignment of interests in dealing with third countries than that suggests, and there is more appetite on the EU side and there can be on our side to buddy up on these things that even if we're living with different free trade agreements with uh, key third country partners, we may have the same interests in terms of market access into those markets and levering those markets open. So we, uh, in our interest, diverge to a degree. And, and uh, as I say, one of the advantages of exit for us is that we'll be free to prosecute our own interests rather than melding our interests with those of the other 27. But there is nevertheless an awful lot of common ground in dealing with closed and difficult markets where you know, EU or UK companies don't have public procurement opportunities. We have the same attacking ambitions. So I think there's a lot of common, even on the subject of filing our own schedules at the WTO, there is a lot of common ground with the EU. Yes, it'll be a difficult fight on various things on tariff rate quotas, but actually there is an interest in the, for the EU in going together with the UK on the schedules issue and not opening up problems for the EU side. So there is more common ground than I think you're suggesting. Um, and at the moment, uh, you know, when, uh, before I left, uh, relations with DG Trade are on these issues, we <coughs> very frequently found ourselves in quite close alignment with DG Trade positions on a whole range of free trade issues and free trade deals. They're trying to open up an EU-Australia uh, deal, an EU-Mercosur deal, an EU-New Zealand deal. Um, they are trying to push forward with the trade liberalisation agenda, mu much of which we agree with. Now, I suppose part of your question then is getting at the transatlantic question. Um, we're very early days in judging what the Trump administration's trade policy will be, but we're starting to hear some flavor of that, but who knows where that takes them. Obviously, if the Americans are in the business of saying that there will be no deals with a trade bloc like the EU and they'll only be dealing with individual countries in terms of free trade deals, well, there's no such thing in the EU 27 as an individual country. They can't strike an individual trade deal with Germany or France. It's not available to them because there's a common commercial policy. So there, there would be a tension if we were able to move further and faster on a transatlantic free trade deal with the Americans. One, there will be some tension inside the EU about whether we do that and how far we go before departing, but I do think that's manageable. And then there may be a question of, well, hang on, you're then delivering privileged access and a privileged relationship as an individual state, but there's nothing in this for the EU. I can't at this stage tell you, does that then trigger responses from some of the other member states saying, well, if the Brits are in that mode with the Americans, maybe you know, we then move forward as a block of 27 with you know, the Japanese or the Indians or others and don't cut the UK in on the benefits of their deal or take it. We're not at, we're not at that point yet, I don't think. Okay. I hope that's a... Yeah. You, you famously said that uh, you're not afraid to speak the truth to those, those in power. Uh, the decision on the Article 50 uh, deal will not be solely determined by the government. The Prime Minister said that the House of Commons will have a vote. I mean, the more I, I'm like Richard, the more I listen to you, I'm not only glad I voted to get out, I think we should get out very quickly. Um, what would be your advice to me as a Member of Parliament in saying we should uh, vote for no deal because it is better than a bad deal or a deal that takes five, six, seven uh, years to arrive at and I'd want to leave now with no deal. What would be your advice to Members of Parliament who are thinking along those lines? Very, very uh, good and complex question. Uh, let me try, uh, try my best. <laughs> Try my best to answer it. Um, as ever on these questions, it's it, it, you, you have to you have to look at the uh, the real world consequences of exiting without a deal. I mean, one of the chief objections, which seems to me to have animated those who wanted to leave, but also the British public on the EU, is that it's become something they didn't think they voted for in the first place, and it's not just a common market, and it's become intrusive and burdensome and complex, etc., etc. There is a reality to that, and you're not going to get from me um, 
uh, a contrary view. It's become a very different beast over the 43 years we were in it from the uh, thing that we uh, joined in 1973. That's indu indu indubitably the case. And other uh, most continental European member states, although you may say you know, it's more their elites than their publics, are more relaxed about that than we are. Um, and they view this as a process of formation of something rather than an end state. Um, My point is that you don't disentangle yourselves very easily from 43 years uh, where the acquis communautaire has got into virtually every nook and cranny of UK economic and social life very easily or abruptly. You're, I mean, so you're, you're positing that kind of, well, can't we just cut the strings, get to hell out of it, this sounds like a bad enterprise to be anywhere near for very long, just do it. My advice to you, as it would be and was inside the government, is you've got to work through every area then of British economic life and work through what does the default to W2 option really mean and really entail and where does it really take you? Because obviously I can I entirely understand the, you know, both the political appeal of that and the desire to get on with it and the desire to push on as rapidly as possible. The public has voted to exit. They want to see exit happen. <coughs> The issue for me is how do we maximise the opportunities from exit, minimise the costs and minimise the disruptions and disturbances. And I think the issue for all of you to examine on the, uh, the costs of an abrupt exit is what then happens sector by sector. How do I, how do I explain this best? If you take a I've given you the financial services example, but you can look at the aviation sector or the pharmaceutical sector or the medicine sector or uh, phytosanitary and food sector. I mean, you can go through, you have to go through each of these areas. We can and you can legislate and will be legislating on the Great Repeal Bill to ensure that there isn't a gap in jurisdiction and gap in law in the UK. That is easily done, and, and the chairman was responsible for an early uh, cockshy attempt at how you would do that, and that is a kind of methodology for how you leave the European Union and ensure that things don't fall over inside the UK uh, the day after exit, say that's April the 1st, 2019, or whatever. Um, that's fine, and you can do that. It's an enormously complex uh, legal process, uh, both inside government and no doubt for the House, but you can do that. What you can't do is legislate for what the other side does in terms of market access. An awful lot of market access and single market access is dependent on the certification and accreditation of authorities that have to be authorities of the country of a member state. We will cease to be a member state on day certain in 2019. And therefore, it's not just a matter of changing our own legislation. Um, at the point where we cease to be a member state, access to the single market in certain areas automatically lapses unless there is a replacement legal agreement which has been drawn up. So the cost of walking away, as others say, well, you can walk away by all means, but then UK licensed medicines that are OK in the UK, they're no longer OK on the European market because you no longer have the authorisation and accreditation to go with it. Now, I'm not saying that to be spine chilling. I'm just saying, in error, I mean, this is extraordinarily difficult uh, stuff to go through. It crosses the whole economy. There will be differential effects in different sectors of the economy. But what it would need is a really stone cold, sober analysis of what would exiting to WTA for a period, at least for a period of years. If we did that and abruptly and unilaterally, then there would be no appetite on the side of the EU27 subsequently to sit down for several years and negotiate a preferential trade agreement with us and a free trade agreement. So if you walk away, we have to be clear that then we are living permanently, well, not permanently, but for, for many years in a WTO-only world. Well, then you have to understand the implications of a WTO-only world in micro detail. And you have to, if, you, if for example, we came out of the customs <coughs> union and there were no separate customs, uh, of course you can come out of the customs union and then develop a customs cooperation agreement over a period of you know, months and years with the European Union. If you had no such agreement, what would happen? And what are the risks then for the export of British goods into the European market? That's what one needs to know. Uh, Stephen Kinnock and then Michael Tomlinson. Uh, many thanks, Ryan, for uh, joining us today. Um, contrary to some of my colleagues, everything you've said so far convinced me what a massive risk our country has taken uh, on the 23rd of June. But there you are. Um, two questions from me. One, just going back to the issue of the exit check. 
Uh, and as you say, Michel Barnier has mentioned the figure of 40 to 60 billion euro. Um, can you give us an assessment of how legally binding the, U the UK's liabilities are? So if we were to refuse to pay that money, would the EU take us to court? And if so, which court? Uh, and the second question is, um, in terms of this uh, immensely complex process that you've mentioned, it seems inevitable that some sort of interim deal will have to be done. How likely do you think it is that the EU is minded to give us a bespoke interim deal, or would they be more minded to simply say the EEA is there as a ready-made model, you should, uh, the UK should transfer into the EEA, uh, and that once that happens at the end of the Article 50 process, we can then invoke Article 218 and begin negotiations on the Comprehensive Free Trade Agreement, which, as you've said, would probably take several years. So the EEA would be a sort of departure lounge whilst we wait uh, for the Article 218 process to be completed, which, of course, involves the ratification of 38 parliaments. Um, well, on the budgetary question, um, my expectation, again, I'm sorry if this sounds unduly cynical, is that the lawyers on the two sides of the channel will not agree about uh, either the extent or bindingness of the financial liabilities. Um, so uh, my own view um, is, uh, as I say, I don't know the origin or uh, of the 40 to 60 billion, but I think I can guess a significant part of it would be the UK share of the so-called reste à liquide, that's the gap in the European Union accounting jargon between commitments and payments, and that's ballooned to an absolutely enormous number, as the chairman knows probably better than anybody. Uh, we account in terms of payments, and we've always focused on the payments number, and successive chancellors and treasury ministers have focused on the payments number and what actually goes out through the door from the extractor. Others are much more focused on the commitments number, and there is a gap. Ridiculously, the gap has grown now um, to more than 200 billion euros, and will, by the end of 2018, I suspect, have grown to nearer 240, 250 billion euros. If you just do a, a finger in the air, sort of UK share of that would be... Um, uh, 12 percent, then that alone would be um, you know somewhere between 25 and 30 billion euros. The others will, I think, I can't again, I, I, I'm hesitant to generalize this is an active discussion going on in Brussels and in the member states and in every finance ministry in the 27. The others will think, I suspect, and will have their legal justification for why we, why we might be on the hook for our proportion of the role. Certainly the commission theologians will be. Um, I don't know when it comes to the member states whether they will be or whether they will push their luck on that. And as I say, I, I think it's important to distinguish. I, then there are other components of it, like the pensions, pensions issue and pensions for Eurocrats, and others will think we're up for our share of future pension liabilities in an unfunded pension scheme, and we will like... On pensions, are we going to be liable for all the pensions of all the people who, from this country, now perhaps some of them, you know, MPs and so on, who, who pension, will we have to contribute to that for the rest of their lives? Well, th I think this will come down to the question both for, um, you know, Eurocrat, Eurocrats and, you know, commission employee, commission employees and the commission pension scheme as well as MEPs. Um, and uh, this will be a complex question. I don't know, I'm not familiar you know, in detail with exactly how the Commission pension scheme uh, uh, works, but I can imagine where the others might come from and say, well, your liabilities don't cease, especially for that period when those people were officials, 1973 to 2018 or whatever, when you were in the European Union. You can't just walk away. The others will, I think, argue you can't just walk away from your liabilities and say you have no liability after 2019. Not saying this is right or wrong. I think there are lots of things that the other side will argue that will be profoundly wrong, and will be um, trying to present us with a much larger bill than we would ever want to pay or think legally justified to pay. Mm -hmm. Just to be clear, have some laws as well, aren't there? Yeah, with conflicts yeah. of interest. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then there are other components of this. Uh, so, I, but. I suppose, again, my point would be there is the legal question where you, know, uh, you don't have to be um, uh, 
bit too cynical to think that the Commission Legal Service and the Council Legal Service may not come to the same view as the UK Legal Service and uh, the Treasury solicitors on this. And in the end, this either becomes a negotiation where both sides have their own uh, version of the law and version of the liabilities and you thrash out uh, a number, or one side or other walks, or there is a political negotiation about what number is tolerable or isn't tolerable and over what time scale and what that looks like. This will be an immensely complex part of the next six to 12 months if there is a negotiation on a withdrawal treaty. Money and the acquired rights of citizens will be big. On your transition EEA point, if I may, I mean, uh, again, we, we, don't, we don't know. I think the appetite to do a bespoke interim deal will be probably, if I'm candid, quite limited. People will say, well, you want a bespoke final deal and we should focus on the final deal and the final destination and where you want to get. And then I think you're probably right that they'll want either a cookie cutter or, or sort of standard non-bespoke set of transitional arrangements to bridge us to there. And that may be wholly unpalatable to us. And there's a big political debate to be had <coughs> over that. On your EEA model, as you know, there are people, uh, if I can put it in uh, referendum terms, both ex-remainers and ex-leavers, there are people um, profoundly uh, pro-exiting the European Union who put that proposition, I think, of people like Richard North um, with their, uh, and the Flexit paper that he and others produced, put that kind of proposition on the table. They said you will need some sort of exit anti-chamber uh, process before you get to full exit, precisely because of the complexity to which I've alluded. So their argument was, using the EEA, they also argue that in the EEA there's more flexibility to do things on free movement than there is inside the EU. So there are people on all sides of this argument who've argued that you would need some sort of transitional arrangement over maybe some years before you got to your ultimate destination in order that you had a negotiation which tackled all the complexity sector by sector. Because I think one thing I probably haven't made clear enough already, but it probably is implicit in what I've been saying, is I don't think there will be appetite from the other side of the table to do loads of different legally binding sectoral deals on a different timescale. I think it'll be the classic European jargon of nothing is agreed until everything is agreed, and therefore they'll think and say, well, you don't get anything on financial services and market access, which they think we all care enormously about, until you've also clarified where we are on medicines and pharmaceuticals and automotive. And, you know. So I think there will be an appetite, and I would be surprised if some of that didn't appear in the guidelines for the 27, which says this is all one ball of wax and a single negotiation. Right, Michael Tomlinson. Chair, thank you very much. Sorry, and good morning. Uh, it won't surprise you, I, I differ from Stephen and his uh, outlook um, in life. But just to pick up something that Graham and the thread that Graham asked as, as well earlier on, uh, most departments have an interest in Brexit related policy. And in your experience, how should that process be managed to allow all the necessary information to be fed into the negotiations, both at the right time, but also in good time as well? Very complex question. As I say, this, is, this will be the single most complex negotiation um, the UK system will have conducted, and I suspect for the other side of the table as well. This is, this is not like negotiating with South Korea and, uh, and Canada. This is like negotiating with the UK or with the US, and, and with even more politics than negotiating with the US. So it's huge. Um, not for me anymore, uh, but obviously my advice um, uh, has been you need a really top-class negotiating team across each of these individual areas of the, of the Aki. Mm -hmm. um, and you will need sort of lead negotiators in each area who really know their onions and have a top-class team capable of matching up against the other side. Some of this obviously emerged um, uh, in my um, uh, uh, email. It's absolutely essential to get that right and to have top quality people on it who know their stuff and can run individual sectoral negotiations and then report up both officially through the Sherpa and uh, ministerially up through David Davis uh, to the Prime Minister. And the complexity of it is they'll obviously be reporting inside their line ministry. So whoever is in charge of sort of agricultural market access or phytosanitary obviously has a reporting line up to the Secretary of State for Agriculture, quite rightly or you know, whoever uh, runs the aviation uh, chunk of this negotiation reports up to the Secretary of State for transport. But they will also, I think, have to have 
some direct relationship with the centre, certainly at kind of Sherpa level, and then up through the Sherpa to, as I say, uh, the Secretary of State for exiting the European Union and the Prime Minister, because the trade-offs can only really be made by the Prime Minister or in a, you know, a small cabinet committee, and there will be trade-offs. I mean, at certain points, when it gets rough on trade negotiations, the Prime Minister level will have to step in and say, well, you know what, I actually care more about that than that, and that may dismay Secretary of State for X, but I'm going to go hell for leather for that because that's more important to me in the country than that. And we have to enable the Prime Minister to be able to take those decisions very seriously and very rapidly, because if we want a really rapid negotiation, we have to be geared up for a really rapid negotiation. The governance of it is difficult on the UK side. It's, you can imagine, it's immensely difficult on the 27 side. Um, the 27 will are already setting up machinery which enables Coropa at 27, Coropa without me or my uh, successor, uh, to meet on a weekly basis to discuss uh, you know, the withdrawal treaty and then wherever we go on the, on the future treaty. So they will have a weekly rhythm. It will be governed by a Kerapa at 27. The person in the chair of that will be working for the President of the European Council, the um, you know, regularly mentioned Didier Zeus, the um, ex-Belgian diplomat who was uh, Helmut van Rompuy's uh, chef de cab. So he will chair a process of the 27. And you'll need, frankly, a combination of people who looked a bit like me, the permanent representatives, but then sectoral experts from the capitals or from the permanent representations brought in for each chunk of the discussion. But that, uh, they, of course, then each member state, you know, if you're Germany or France, you have a huge uh, number of people already servicing this and already thinking about it in your capital in order to be able to service that machinery in Brussels. And then the 27 in Brussels will have to meet, you know, whoever the Prime Minister nominates them to meet from the UK. I think a lot of this inevitably, I'm afraid, has to be done at official level because it will be unbelievably kind of technical, difficult, complex in each of these areas. But in the end, I mean, officials can't decide anything and shouldn't decide anything on their own. All of this has to be you know, properly run and account you know, officials have to be accountable to uh, cabinet committee machinery and to the prime minister for the positions they take in the room up against the 27 on each of these individual dossiers. So I hope I've made it sound complex because I think it is complex. I think we can get it right, but it, um, what, what I was trying to stress, I can come on to the reasons for putting that in, uh, in an email to my staff. What I was trying to stress to my staff on exit uh, was that UPCREP people, who, who are um, fantastic, incidentally, but also an amalgam of domestic civil servants, most of them from domestic departments, foreign office civil servants and locally based staff, they're probably the biggest, they are certainly the biggest single collection of expertise on negotiating with the 27 that the country has. Uh, they have enormous expertise in wisdom in each of these areas built up from their time negotiating up against the 27 and dealing with the institutions. And they will have to play some role, I hope, in both formulating UK objectives and in thinking through where we're going and in thinking through where the other 27 are coming from and then thinking through how do we maximise our chances of getting the best possible outcome for the UK. Could I uh, just uh, move on from that point? We're still in the EU. Uh, since the 23rd of June, um, the volume of stuff that comes to us has not slowed down. In fact, in certain respects, it's become more critical. Yeah. Uh, we do a thousand documents a year, and um, to use Ken Clark's analogy with the burrow that he came up with yesterday, um, it goes straight down the burrow and it lands in Wonderland. And Wonderland is here in the House of Commons because it goes through sections two and th two of the European Communities Act, and it is in the pipeline and it is of extreme importance to the people of this country because we're being actually legislated for by this process. Um, we did a report back last year, just before the referendum itself, and we concluded from the evidence we'd taken that um, it was estimated that the great majority of legislation is agreed without any debate at all at a ministerial level having been previously negotiated by officials in the Council of Preparatory Bodies, working groups and CORAPA, 
um, and that it had been estimated that most decisions, around 70%, are in practice made before reaching the council level and are proposed by Corpa for adoption as A items. Now, you'll understand this really serious problem about the democratic deficit, which just doesn't seem to have been generally uh, understood. Uh, people think there's majority voting going on, uh, but in practice, an awful lot of it is done behind closed doors by consensus. So we really need to move on to this question to get your considered view about that. Um, and I'm going to ask uh, Stephen Kinnock if he would ask the first question about relationships in the council. This is a huge democratic question about the manner in which legislation is made. I'd be grateful for your comments. Stephen. Yes, yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, the government's explanatory memoranda repeatedly tells us that the UK will remain a member of the EU and engage fully in the negotiations until it exits. How robustly is the UK engaging in negotiations in working groups, which is where most, negotia most negotiations happen, of course, uh, in co repa and council? Um, well, I will also try and uh, deal with some of the uh, chairman's observations as well, if I may. Um, very robustly, and there was no reason to change after the referendum, and that was the message I gave. Uh, to staff that I wanted people, uh, and that was the message coming down from on high from senior ministers, wanted people to engage completely normally and fight their corner in working groups as I would in Kerapa because this legislation uh, either would still or might still apply to us and we still had our equities at the table, we were one of 28 member states until we ceased to be. Um, and that has been the posture of, of UPREP. Um, uh, uh, you know, ever, ever since June uh, the 24th and will remain so. I'd make a couple of observations on it. Um, well, first of all, the role of UPREP has to evolve and um, was evolving and I was trying to evolve it as rapidly as possible um, you know, after June the 24th. We have to do three things really in UPREP. One is the ongoing business and do it as professionally uh, and robustly as we can until we exit and protect kind of UK interests and fight for UK interests. Two was to play a major part with an emerging new ministry which was set up in uh, June uh, in Dexu, uh, growing like Topsy but without um, a, a huge amount, no disrespect to a lot of the people joining it who are excellent people, but I mean that without a huge amount of kind of EU um, experience, an awful lot of them. So UCREP um, I was saying to my staff, as you, indeed you saw in the email as well, play a very active, vigorous role getting back to London all the time and engaging with domestic policy making staff because UPREP has to take a bigger role in helping people formulate the right policies and right objectives and you've got the street wisdom and understand the negotiations. And then the third thing, the ambition um, I had and I'm sure my successor will have, we have to then be the best third country mission in Brussels um, uh, from the date that we are a third country mission, whenever that is, in, you know, if that's spring 2019, then we have to look ahead to being a third country mission, like the Americans, like the Swiss, like the Norwegians. I already was talking well before the referendum to all uh, counterparts from third countries, trying to prepare that, thinking ahead to what does the best in class for a uh, a mission outside the European Union look like. So that's a, a bit on the uh, uh, on the role of uh, UPREP. I think the the thing I would say. I mean, obviously, one status in the room, both in Corupa and in working groups, uh, post the decision to exit, is different and it feels different. And um, even though I've been around a lot and people know me and have known me for years, sometimes decades. Uh, in, in this business, it already felt much less like 28 people negotiating around a table than it did before, and a lot of more junior people in UCREP were experiencing that in working groups, because inevitably people, um, they, well, they, it's not that you get sort of personal kind of why are you taking the microphone, what's it got to do with you, you're not going to be there, sort of, but there is a sentiment of, well, an awful lot of this, we're now moving this project on without you, we're increasingly seeing leaders meeting at 27. I fought tooth and nail to prevent anything other than leaders meeting at 27 because the council is the council is the council and the council's at 28 and therefore there can't be council formation meetings at 27. That's extremely dangerous on anything legislative because otherwise we're just cut out of the process and it is being applied to us and we're not even in the room discussing it. 
we've held the line on that, but there's no question that other member states are looking at us differently now than they were a year ago because they're thinking, well, you're going to be gone in a couple of years' time, so why should I have got to listen to your views on data protection because it won't apply to you and you'll be doing your own thing. That's what you want your sovereignty and autonomy for. Why have we got to listen to your views about the legislative arrangements that apply for 27? That's wrong, and as I say, I fought that very vigorously over, uh, over the last several months. Any legislation going through the pipeline is still going through the legislative process that uh, we all know, and many of us don't much like, um, and applies to the 28, and we have our rights and we have our voting rights, and we have our right to say on the microphone what we want and what we don't want. But I'm just giving you a spirit of, and one of the things I was trying to address, because it had been a repeated subject of discussion with UCREP staff through the autumn via my email, was precisely that sense of our job is changing on us quite radically. And frankly, my brightest and best in UCREP were saying to me, sometimes one-to-one, -one, frequently in all staff meetings or in other staff meetings, well, um, if I'm going to stay here and fight uh, for the interests of the country on the exit negotiations and any subsequent trade negotiation, I need to know that that's what uh, you know, ministers want and that's what senior officials back in London want. And I need to know that UCREP is majorly engaged and personally engaged in that, otherwise I'm going to be off. Um, right. But More. don't you don't you think that uh, in an area where it's quite manifestly in our national interest? I mean, I think of the ports regulation as an example. Yeah. Um, I came over to Brussels to yeah, speak to you about that. Um, there are circumstances in which we must make it absolutely clear that we would vote against it, yeah. which in previously has not been the, the uh, way of doing things, and to give reasons on the record. And this came out in our previous. Uh, evidence session um, before uh, the referendum itself, so that Parliament and the public will know, post-Brexit, where we are. And by the way, the EU will also know that when we get into the Great Repeal Bill, that there will be positions that have already been struck, yeah. so that people have a clear idea. We're not going to do this. It's not in our national interest. It may have been passed through the Aki, but we're actually going to repeal it, mm. and we are going to make it clear to all and sundry that that is the case. Uh, do you agree with that? As a I do. Uh, yes. No, yeah. no, no dispute that, with any of that. No, no dispute with any of that. I, I, I think my. Uh, my point is, you know, is a bit of a broader one, as I say, of kind of what are what are those people, 150 odd people in UCREP, there for? What are they most there to do? And where is Whitehall's attention these days? My constant point back to London, which I'm sure I've bored many of my colleagues rigid with, is you have to pay attention to the daily business. Exactly your your point, Chairman. Uh, you have to pay attention to the daily business and the daily passage of directives in multiple different areas because others are frankly looking at opportunities in the next couple of years to land things in directives and regulations which they know are going to cause this difficulty. I mean, other people have, um, I'm not saying that, you know, I don't want to then sound paranoid, but obviously that's going on. Um, and we have, to be, we have to be on it. And, you know, again, I don't, I don't, I don't want we here to wash dirty linen, but it's... Uh, <laughs> White, Whitehall, has, Whitehall has a hell of a lot to do on Brexit um, and at speed um, and is building a new ministry and a new trade ministry as well and we don't have trade negotiating expertise because we haven't had trade negotiators and we haven't had to do trade negotiations since before 1973. So we've got a lot of things to do and we've then got all the internal UK specific what are we going to do with our sovereignty and autonomy in individual areas. I would have to say, speaking as the ex-permanent representative, in the six months after the referendum, I saw a diminution of Whitehall attention and effort on day-to-day -day dossiers. I'm not criticising anybody, any department, any minister, and I want to be, make, uh, uh, make that utterly clear. People have run off their feet and working enormously hard, both at ministerial level and at senior official level. But I had many of my officials coming to me in UCREP saying, we had no instructions in this area. I have nothing, nothing to say because I'm not getting anything back from the department. I'm not clear what I'm saying on microphone and what our position is. So it was becoming more difficult in the autumn because people are so stretched with dealing with Brexit and because departmental boards and departmental ministers are understandably going hell for leather for what they want the world to look like after Brexit, we were getting a diminishing 
quality and quantity of instructions through to UCRE on day-to-day -day dossiers which still matter to your committee and matter to other committees. And I, I said repeatedly at Mandarin level, and I think we were working on this and, and Dexia were working on this incessantly, that's not good enough. You have to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. You have to be dealing with these day-to-day -day dossiers. They matter every bit as much as they did. And until we leave, we're full members of the 28, and we have to make good on that. But I'm just reporting from the belly of the beast in Accra. The view from many of my troops was we are simply getting less and less good quality from departments because they're inundated on Brexit issues. Well, could I just give one example? We've got a whole mass of documents on asylum which are directly relevant to the whole question of immigration. And uh, uh, there are documents that are about two inches deep um, on the question, stacks of them. And um, we had to ask in the minister, because we are concerned about the question of whether or not, in the light of what you've said and what I've put to you, um, that actually we appear to be continuing down a route which quite clearly will be ruled out post-Brexit. So we're in agreement about the fact that this is not only important, but that there needs to be a complete focus by Whitehall on the implications of it as we go forward. And then, you, you, above all, people have to know um, and, and weigh up in each area how much it's going to matter. Is this something that we can or should let go because it ceased to matter because we know it's not going to apply to us? Or is it something where, as you say, we have to fight tooth and nail because if we're not careful, we'll be bound by it in some way which constrains our room for manoeuvre post-exit? Right. OK. Uh, Andrew Turner, please. Um, could and should negotiations on EU law such as co-repair be more open? Um, you heard earlier the comment about how, how public these discussions are. It didn't sound very public to me. Um, well, Curripper is a very odd mix, really, uh, between a sort of, you know, it, it's sort of semi-executive and semi-legislative, and that's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not really like anything else I've ever done or like anything that we have here. So one is, one's role is, um, yeah, you know, is partly as a negotiator of a sovereign member state up against negotiators of other sovereign member states and, and, and working, working through, you know, voluminous documents and trying to do deals. And some of it is pure legislative activity because the council, as council, is one of the co-legislators. And the council then has to represent its own interests in the co-legislation process with the European Parliament. And bear in mind, when you're then in trilogues with the European Parliament, I mean, the big institutional development of the last 10 to 15 years really has still been the rise of the European Parliament and the rise of uh, the trilogues process in legislation. As most member states, unless you're in the presidency or in the trio around the presidency, you're not in the room for the trilogue. So you can take a position in Carapa or in council and you can try and hold the presidency's feet to the fire and say, you know, up with this we will not put, and these are our red lines and you cannot breach those red lines. But they, they are the people negotiating with the European Parliament to produce a, a legislative outcome. One of my um, regular mantras to my staff but also to London staff is, you all focus immensely on what happens in the council uh, because your ministers attend the council and you reach a general approach in the council. The general approach is the half-time score, is what I used to call it. Uh, you know, you can be two up at half-time, but then, the, you know, people can, via getting the right briefing to the right European parliamentarians, you know, nip a couple of goals in in the second half during the trilogues process and things that you thought you'd established in the general approach and in council can go away from you. Equally, the same can happen in reverse. We, we had to get smarter. I spent more of my life than any previous permanent representative with the European Parliament. We had to get smarter, and UCRIP had to get smarter, and Whitehall had to get smarter at prosecuting our interests via European parliamentarians, including non-British parliamentarians, to try and get the legislative outcomes we want. But it's not all about the Council anymore. I mean, the European Parliament is an enormously key player in the legislative process and as the chairman says that legislation then applies to UK. Uh, yes, uh, the next question and then Kate please. Right. How, how, how much is the trade-off between negotiations on one dossier and those on another? Well I, that rarely happens that directly because you're dealing you know, in sequence in the room with a sort of, you know, a huge agenda week by week in Carapa. Um I, I agree the bulk of deals 
actual deals on not terribly politically controversial stuff are done in Carapa. I would like to see more substantive discussions and substantive debates in council. There are huge problems, Mr Chairman and the other members of the committee, with the way the council operates overall and it frustrates all members of the council because council at 28 can be a very laborious process and a ritual exchange of speaking note type views by ministers who are understandably a bit bored rigid when they go to it. They don't want they want a more political exchange at council than they frequently get. So I, 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 wouldn't even, I wouldn't give you an argument about too many of the deals effectively being done um, at the bureaucratic level. Equally, part of the job of bureaucrats and technocrats like me or like my successors is to then try and escalate the right issues politically and ensure there's the right political discussion about the stuff that really has politics in it rather than the stuff that can be just dealt with by people like me or by, you know, by my former staff at working group level. Uh, Kate. Thank you. Um, Sir Ivan, can I take you back to the pre-referendum negotiations that you were heavily involved with? Mm. Um, did you get a feeling or did you know about whether any of the 27 countries ever really understood that there was a, a very big possibility that we were going to vote to leave? Uh, did you well, ever say well, to them, for example, by the way, you know, things are looking... I, I don't know whether you would say bad or good in your, your terms. Um, I, I said to them repeatedly, um, I mean, this is one of the many curiosities of the coverage in recent weeks, I, mean, I think I was notorious for it in London and in Brussels for believing that this was uh, basically a 50-50 shot. I said so repeatedly. Uh, I said so before the election, if it came to... Uh, if it came to a referendum, which I thought it might, uh, it might well, which, uh, bear in mind, I started in the October or early November of 2013. At that stage, I think most of my colleagues really didn't believe they would face a majority Conservative government that was committed to a referendum. Um, uh, so for quite a long while, I warned them that I thought that that was actually extremely likely to happen and that if the government uh, was a majority Conservative government, it would not only commit to a referendum, it would go through with it, and then it was eminently possible that it would be lost. Um, so, as I say, one of the curiosities of coverage recently, I'm uh, notorious in uh, government for having thought for many years that we were, it was reasonably likely that we would exit. I've been thinking about post-exit Britain for and some, some of the rather well, fairer coverage in bits of the press points that out and have been talking. Um, about this for many years. And did you tell... And I told my, uh, my best opposite numbers and my key opposite numbers and the people I know best in member states, don't underestimate this. There is a very, very serious risk of this referendum being lost. Now, does that then, you know, do people, do people believe it? You, um, did you tell the Prime Minister your views? I presume you did. That yes, you I, well, I mean, as I say, I think, you know, I, I, as emerges um, quite regularly, I mean, uh, there, there were other many much more sanguine views elsewhere in the system, um, including in some parts of Number 10. I'm not saying the, the Prime Minister directly that the referendum would be won rather comfortably. I never never thought that and never, never said it. I said it was a 50-50 shot. And do you think the negotiating strategy then was, was different or could have been different if perhaps the Prime Minister had perhaps realised or accepted your view that this could be a 50-50? Well, I think, look, I mean, I'm very wary of... You have to be careful about saying anything about my yeah, uh, advice to uh, you know, any, any Prime Minister. You'll under, understand that. And you know, it, it, this puts me in a slightly difficult position because it's obvious that various, <laughs> various former... Uh, uh, for former colleagues have spoken and uh, at length about their views on this. From an official's perspective, I had no role, nor should I have any role, in drawing up the Conservative Party manifesto for the 2015 election. I didn't know, I mean, we didn't even see it until the, uh, we didn't see it before, uh, before it get, got published, nor should we. So Tom Scholar and I, who did the renegotiation, didn't know what was going to be in the manifesto until it was printed. Um, when it was printed, we then did a lot of work during the uh, uh, campaign for the election about if uh, the Conservatives get back in, what, uh, what are they committed to in their manifesto and what does that translate into and what would we do about it. And that, so I feel there is a very clear and direct link between what was in the manifesto 
for the election and what was in the David Cameron letter to Donald Tusk of I think the 10th of November 2015 which itemised his four baskets and then specified what within those four baskets he wanted. You can believe that was the wrong stuff or not enough of the right stuff or completely beside the point or what I mean that's not my that's not as an official what I'm there for. I took no view or, on that. That's not what I'm there for. I'm there, I, I was there along with Tom Scholar and other people working for the Prime Minister to say, that's what you said in your manifesto, that's what we make of it. We turn that into a proposition in terms of where do you want to get in this negotiation, and we then try and go and negotiate it. Um, so I, I don't think as an official there, I know I'm, I'm well aware because I'm on the receiving end of that a lot, and I have.